God is dead. God is dead. Those are the infamous words from Frederick Nietzsche's work, Thus Spoke or Spake Zarathustra. Very, uh, I don't know, comical almost when you hear it. Thus Spoke Zarathustra. Fun name, you should try it. But here's the thing. We think we're so clever and cute. We say things like God is dead and we think very little of it. Uh, actually, Nietzsche thought a great deal of that. He thought that when God dies, if, if we kill him, if we remove him from society, then everything that goes with him goes too. And so there needs to be a new moral order, a new Superman, Ubermank, who will come along and give us the proper moral standards that we need to have. This was spoke in the 1800s. Uh, this was written in the 18, late 1800s, around the same time as uh, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid were robbing banks and uh, trains and all that kind of stuff, and Doc Holliday was dying, around the same time. So while people were distracted with the goofiness over here in the West, over in Germany, Nietzsche was saying things like that, that ended up becoming the philosophy of, well, our modern age. God has been removed. He doesn't matter. We're practical atheists or agnostic as we walk around and we don't bring God to bear down on the decisions of our everyday lives. So now we live in an age where we've tried to kill off God and remove him as much as we can. How's that working out for us? The moral decay is plummeting as our technological rise is on its ascent. Uh, we have things going our way in certain directions, and therefore we think we are blessed of God. Psalm chapter 2, we have a group of clever people in a similar way who think they are very shrewd, very smart. They think they're so good that they're plotting something. They're scheming something. Verse 1 says this, Why are the nations in an uproar and the peoples devising a vain thing? What are you devising? What are you scheming for? That's the, the thrust of what's going on in this verse. Here we have the nations plotting and planning, scheming something. And God's perspective is it's a vain thing. It's an empty thing. The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, let us tear their fetters apart and cast away their cords from us. Aren't they cute? Aren't we cute? We all think we're so clever. We all think we're so unique in the plans and designs that we come up with. We all think nobody else has ever come up with our philosophy or our way of dealing with things. And that somehow we are going to be the one that can rule and rule well. Every generation, just look at American history, the last several generations, one generation comes along and said the last generation was stupid. They have no idea what they're doing. We'll show you how it should be done. They start running things and we see what happens. The next generation is here and they're about to start taking over every institution in America. Where do we really think that's going to go? In our scheming, in our plotting, what we want more than anything is to remove any of the authority and restraints that God has put upon humanity. And uh, we're now getting down to base level, foundational level issues. We don't know what marriage is. We have a hard time defining gender. Uh, we, we can't uh, read a text clearly for what it says. That is, we can't read the Bible for what it actually says, and when we actually read it and understand it, then we don't like what it says, so we find a way to wipe it off, uh, to, to erase it. We want to tear the handcuffs, as we view them, the restraints that God has put on us. I don't want to be defined simply by my gender. I am my own invented gender. I can't be defined by uh, parameters that society puts on me, I will be defined by my own way of coming up with those things. Except I'm using the language that everyone else understands and I'm 
within those parameters, but we won't talk about that further. Instead, what we have is humanity doing here in these three verses what humanity always does. Go to war with God. I want my own way. Each of us, like sheep, has gone astray. All of us have gone our own way. We have that nature about us, that desire to wander away from what is established and what is known. We got to find a new way. We can't actually just read the Bible for what it has to say and allow that to become authority in our life. Instead, we, like the people described here, would love to take our stand. We would love to take our stand with the rulers of this age and take our stand against God and against His plan and say, we're going my way. Now this is a, a psalm that's a royal psalm, they call it. And it's a psalm that would have been read or used at special occasions, especially in the inauguration of a king, the, the arrival of a new king. And it was meant to encourage the people and it was meant to uh, remind them of God being sovereign over all things and uh, the, all the affairs of men, and that we are not nearly as big of a deal as we like to think we are. We then see God's response to the plot and the schemes and plans of mankind. Is God shaken by the words of Nietzsche? Is God rattled? by the united power of the world against him. It says here in verse 4, He who sits in the heavens laughs. And to make sure we understand the nature of the laugh, it says the Lord scoffs at them. <laughs> so, I don't know if you've ever seen any of these shows, but there'll be like a movie or a TV series even, where you'll have human beings fighting against supernatural beings. They'll fight against demons or angels or something like that. And they will... I remember seeing a show where a guy had a gun. He's shooting angels and taking them out because those, those bullets were like put in like holy water or some garbage like that. The idea of the mortal taking on the immortal is ancient, that concept. But the stupidity of it, when you start to put it together, that is the, the material is going to take on the immaterial with material objects. It, it defies logic to even imagine that we are going to take on our Creator, and yet we will always imagine it. We will always pretend that somehow that might happen. God's response to that is, this is a joke. You're, you're a bunch of clowns. You think you're going to take on God and His anointing, whoever it is that He would establish on the throne? Absurd. How is it you're going to actually fight against God and win? Hasn't the scripture taught you that? If, if you are a, a Jew of this era, and we would assume this is happening after the time of David, it seems that uh, what's being referenced here in part is the Davidic covenant from 2 Samuel 7. And uh, so going on after that, this would probably be read for any king who is worth his salt, who, who wants to be viewed as God's man on the throne. But of course, we know that the ultimate fulfillment of this, of all that's going on here, is Christ. And we can see down as we look at the end times, as the wrapping up of the universe, we can see that, of course, the world will unite in its effort to try to take on the resurrected, the ascended, and the returning King, Jesus Christ. How's that going to work out for him? They're going to devise their plot and their plan. And then if you're reading Revelation 19 right, uh, the Lord shows up and speaks and just, it's undone. He unravels their plan. And there, there is the, the need or the reason, rather, for the laugh. You've got your stuff. You've got your armies together. Aren't you adorable? that you think you're going to somehow crush the Almighty. Absurdity to the highest degree. So a laugh here is fitting, certainly fitting. The Lord sits 
the one who sits, he resides enthroned is the idea, in the heavens, laughs and he scoffs at them. And he will speak to them in his anger and terrify them in his fury, saying, but as for me, you got your plan. You got your king or kings or whatever it is that you have. But as for me, I have installed my king upon Zion, my holy mountain. There's no stopping God's plan or his purpose. What we have going on in the world today might have many people scoffing and laughing. We have the G7 uh, leaders getting together, proclaiming, you know, how they're going to change the world and the things they're going to do to shape it and all of that. And they think they're in control. But didn't COVID remind everyone just how very little control we really have? We're, we're passing climate accords and all this kind of stuff. Like we think we're going to change the weather. We think we control the weather now. Uh, when we fail to just recognize even on a simple level, if one volcanic eruption itself, one volcanic eruption can do way more damage to the environment than whatever the United States pumps out in a decade. I'm just shocked that we have yet to learn all this time that we're really not in control. And there's not even a, a, an acknowledgement that God is ultimately sovereign over the affairs of the United States and the other, you know, G7 nations. We have so discarded him, we've so pushed him aside that we are living, as I said, as practical atheists. And we want his restraints to be broken so that we can rule ourselves because we think we do a better job than God. We have better morals. We have better standards. So you come now to verse 7, 8, and 9, and what we see is the king's claim to his throne. So first we had... Uh, the, the plot and the plan of the nations in the first three verses, then you see God's response, and now you see the, the king's claim to the throne. He says, I will surely tell of the decree of the Lord. He said to me, you are my son, today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will surely give the nations as your inheritance, and the very ends of the earth as your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall shatter them like earthenware. So we see no inability for the king to claim his throne. We see no hesitation even there. Instead, we find a, a king who will reign supremely. Verse 10, now we shift after considering this king's claim to the throne and the nature and the power of the one who has his back and all of that. Now we come to advice for these would-be king-making nations, those who would cast God aside. Now therefore, O kings, show discernment. Pause for a second and think. Take warning, O judges of the earth. Worship the Lord with reverence and rejoice with trembling. Do homage to the Son, that he not become angry, and you perish in the way, for his wrath may soon be kindled. How blessed are all who take refuge in him. So we have in our world today a series of nations that are wildly arrogant, that seem to think that we are going to last forever, as though one mighty empire after another hasn't crumbled throughout history. We tend to think that we cannot fall, that it won't happen in our day, that we won't see it. We fail to see that the true kingmaker, the one who sets up, the one who tears down, the one who establishes, and the one who removes is the Almighty. And so the very least that we ought to do as residents here on earth is to show some discernment. Look at history and learn something. What is it that led to the downfall of one empire after another? Show discernment. Learn, take the warning, and listen. Worship the Lord with reverence and rejoice with trembling. That's an interesting mix, isn't it? Rejoice with trembling, but that's kind of the mix there is when you consider the, the awesomeness of the Almighty God, the I Am. He's not 
it's, it, he's not asking for a simple one-dimensional response, emotionally speaking. It, almost no relationship is truly like that. Any relationship you have real depth with, isn't, there isn't just one emotion you have for your wife. There are many emotions. And the, the response to the Almighty is not as simple as just rejoice, nor is it just as simple as trembling. There is a, a package deal that comes with all this. Know who He is. And allow that to shake you. And then, as you recognize what he has taught and that you are on his team, rejoice. Rejoice in the fact that you know him. Not that you're a big deal. Not that you're among one of the G7 nations or something in that vein. But rejoice that you know him. And do homage to the Son. Uh, the most ancient translations of this say, kiss the Son. Uh, show him the respect he is due. Speaking of Jesus Christ, that he not become angry and you perish in the way. Uh, show respect rightly to whom it's due, as he deserves. For wrath, his wrath, may soon be kindled. Man, I, I look at our country and I read prophetic literature and I come to Romans 1, and I put these things together in my mind, and I think, man, we are provoking God to his face. It's, it's heartbreaking, it's scary, it's aggravating. It's all of that. We are provoking God by our sins that we are multiplying before him. The fact that we have, going back to the beginning of what I was saying and starting this video, we have pushed him aside. We have lived as though he doesn't matter. Now, most of us would not be so arrogant as to say God is dead. We wouldn't say that out loud, and we would barely entertain the thought. But in reality, is he dead in your life? Or is he reigning day in and day out in the choices and the decisions that you make? Is he foremost in those things? And then it returns in this almost jarring jump the very last line, how blessed are all who take refuge in him. If you took the warning right, if you showed discernment right, if you took out of this psalm what you should and, and you repented, then you're blessed, truly blessed. Going back to Psalm 1 verse 1. How blessed are all who take refuge in him. Find him to be their safety and security. There's the blessed person, not the one who puts their hope and, and desire and strength in nations, in armies, in helicopters and tanks, but the one who takes their refuge, their source of security is God, the rock, not the sand of this world. This is an awesome psalm, and this is one that moves you in many ways. I, I love this psalm, and I hope you do too, and I hope this has been enriching as we've gone through it. See you next time.